All right, coming up 12 seconds. Those of you in the back there getting your desserts, come on in. You've got airplanes flying through the room now. That sounds good. You guys are having fun. All right, I'll give you two minutes. Come on in. Come on, have a seat. We're going to get the show rolling. Some of these guys got to go to work tomorrow morning. <laughs> Oh, I think you're going to have injury case over here. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you a 10-second warning. Ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Are we ready? Come on. <laughs> hey, well, good evening. You guys, are re you guys are ready for a good treat tonight? All right. How many of you guys have come here in the last couple of years? All right. Believe it or not, this is our 15th year that we've had Profile of Champions, and we've kind of moved around. In fact, I was talking to someone today, Katie, which is a great staff person here. We had one of our first ones, believe it or not, at the old Newport Beach Country Club Clubhouse. And to give you an idea how this has grown, by the way, this is all remodeled, by the way, over the last year. And I want to give thanks to Kevin and Devin Martin for having us here again this year. Thank you, guys for all you guys do to make our jobs easy. And your staff is incredible. And uh, I just want to just say, yeah, th enjoy this place. And by the way, tonight, as you guys get your valet parking, it's complimentary, but take care of the guys that bring in your car, okay? Because these guys work hard out there. So again, thanks, Kevin and Devin, for really giving that for our uh, attendees here tonight. I'm Derek Wong, if any of you haven't met me. I'm the Southern California, Las Vegas Regional Director for Lynx Players. So Lynx Players is a ministry that's been around for over 40 years. And, uh, but tonight, there's a good friend, and I want to introduce you. He'll be the MC tonight. And uh, Larry's been involved with the PGA Tour for over 40, is it 45 years now, Larry? 44. 44. I'm, I'm moving him up. But I, let me... Give him a nice, warm applause, Orange County, and there are some, for Larry Moody. Hey, give him your whistle. Come on, what's your sign? Come on, Larry. He wants me to give you the train. If you've been here, you've heard it before. That's called the birdie train. When guys are... Uh, making birdies, they get the birdie train. The problem of it is if they make a birdie and I didn't see it, I get dirty looks. That what, no, no train for me? Uh, and in Europe, when we're playing the Ryder Cup, it's the only positive sign or sound that the US uh, players hear outside of an occasional faint, USA, USA. So we give them a <laughs> Let me uh, introduce to you our panel for tonight. We'll go from oldest to youngest. The one who started uh, earliest on the Champions Tour in 2006. I want to introduce to you Fred Funk, who he's done so much. I've got to look at uh, all the stuff he's done. Come on, my friend. Fred has won nine times on the Champions Tour. Uh, he has uh, two international wins as a uh, senior, uh, but he's played in 327 tournaments. He has made the cut in 317 of the 327. In 2009, he won the U.S. Senior Open and then lost in a playoff at the British Senior Open, uh, all of that part of it. And then on the regular tour, he won eight wins. And I'm going to ask you a little later about the uh, Players' Championship because how many of you watched uh, Scotty Scheffler on Sunday? Well, uh, both Justin and Fred have won the uh, Players' Championship, and I've Got a question for both of them about that. And uh, so you can be uh, nervous about what I'm going to. No, I'm not. You don't have to be. 
Uh, he played on two President's Cups, uh, played on a Ryder Cup, and uh, just won a little $34 million total. That's not bad. I, uh, uh, did I tell you about the loan, Ruthie? No. I was going to ask these people for a while. Next is Doug Barron, who was with us uh, last year. Doug uh, was on the tour for a little bit, and then he went and did business. And when he turned 50, he says, you know, I'm still playing golf pretty good. Uh, when he turned 50, he went and qualified for the uh, Senior British Open and uh, finished, what did you finish, Dougie, at the Senior British Open? Did you? Fifth. Uh, he had to come over because he didn't have his PGA credential anymore. He had to play Thursday at a pre-qualifier, which he won, Monday for a qualifier, which he won, and then from Thursday, I mean, from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, he led the tournament uh, and won his first tournament on the regular tour. He's won another one since at uh, Shaw Classic. He was off last year with some surgery on both elbows, but let's welcome Doug Barron. <laughs> Buddy. Last but not least, Justin Leonard. It could take me a while to get through this one. We're, we're not quitting till 11, right, tonight? <laughs> um, he just joined. He's played 24 times on the Champions Tour, made all the cuts, has not won yet, has come in second, but on the regular tour, 12 wins, including the Players' Championship in 98, the Open Championship they call it the Open Championship over there, right? The British Open, he won, but we call it the Open Championship in 97. Uh, 99 top tens, $33 million. I'm not, I'm not sure your beautiful wife knows it's that much. Was I not supposed to say that? His son, Sky, and his beautiful wife right here, Amanda, let's give them a welcome. Justin played on five President's Cups, three Ryder Cups, two World Cups, the Walker Cup, the Dunhill Cup, and the World Amateur Team Championship. Come on. Yeah, but he never wore a cup. Did you ever wear a cup? That's amazing. Uh, you played in a few Ryder Cups. Yeah. Well, I was just saying, if you did this same introduction and Bernhard was here, by the time you're done, we're over. Yes. Everybody just leaves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the newspaper said that Bernard tore his Achilles in an exercise program. Pickleball. It's called pickleball. pickleball. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> Be careful. It's the new CrossFit. For, we were going <laughs> we to FaceTime For Bernhard. people of our age. There's more people in the hospital or the orthopedic clinic than anything else. I, I think it was invented by orthopedic surgeons. Yeah. Let's uh, go ahead and let's just go down the row and just talk about your family, um, who's in it, and where you live. Uh, well, you've all met Amanda. We've been married 22 years. Um, that's our youngest son, Skyler. He's in eighth grade. Uh, then Luke Leonard, our junior in high school, he was here. Uh, he left today to go play a junior golf tournament in Dallas. Terrific. And then we have two daughters. Uh, we've got a freshman at SMU. Her name is Avery. And then our eldest, Reese, is a second year at UVA. Uh, we, live, we now live in Tequesta, Florida, which is just north of Jupiter. We moved there, oh, uh, it'll be two years ago in June. Yeah, they lived in Aspen for quite a while after he uh, did it, but you can't get prepared for the champion store in Aspen, so they're outside of Jupiter. Now, boy, can this man ski. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I know my way around yeah. a mountain. Let's talk about uh, Dougie. Okay. Uh, my wife, Leslie, we, have been, we will be married 28 years in January. God bless her. Um, 
And we have two sons. Uh, we call our oldest. His oldest goes by Buzz. His name's John William. He serves in the military. He lives in uh, Honolulu right now. Yep. Yeah, he... Uh, College was not for him. He did one semester, got in a fraternity. I still don't know what he made in his grades, but um, COVID hit and he was doing school at home and then he wasn't liking it and he came to us and said he wanted to join the army and we're like, oh my gosh. We, we were like, all right. And, you know, after he did a nine month tour in Syria, after all the crying, I was like, oh, it, it was tough. But uh, he's hung in there. He's married now and has a new wife. And then I have a youngest son, uh, Wiley. He was here last year when I almost won, and uh, so that was pretty cool to have him here. He's 17, he's a junior in high school, and uh, he's living his best life. So, yeah. Freddie? My turn. Um, I have a son from my first marriage, uh, Eric, and he lives in South Korea right now. He works for NSA. He couldn't ever tell me. My ex-wife used to work for NSA. And, uh, counterterrorism, cybersecurity, and my son's doing the same thing and taking a two-year duty in South Korea, and he had my first grandson who I haven't seen yet. Um, my ex-wife went to see him, and I said, I'm going to wait till he comes back, <laughs> and he's coming back in September, and um, so that's really exciting. I'm a, I'm a granddad, and uh, that's, like, I can't comprehend that. And uh, my current marriage, I'll be married 30 years this year. Now I did the math tonight. And uh, I have a 28-year-old son who's on the conditional corn ferry trying to get to the tour. Slash and played, play, yeah, slash bodybuilder. But um, he played on the University of Texas team with Scotty Scheffler, Bo Hostler, and Doug Gim. Another long Hook horn. Right horns. Here. And, uh, I and because of that, my wife was a longhorn. Her whole family was a Longhorn. Now I'm a Longhorn, uh, even though I was a University of Maryland Terrapin. Hell in a shell, well, baby. He's assuming that we claim him. Hell in a him. shell. What's that? You're assuming that we claim you. That is an assumption. Yes. I know. That, yeah, that is an assumption. <laughs> Sharon, fine. I'm not sure if yeah, you're she, in yet. Yeah, that's right. I'm not, I'm not probably in yet. And then my daughter's 24, and she got her master's in art in France at Aix-Provence, and... Um, she wants to just teach kids, but right now she doesn't have that job, and she's taking an uh, online ministry course right now, which kind of came out of nowhere, but uh, really cool, and she really loves it, and uh, we live in Jacksonville, Florida. We just moved back. Um, we moved three years into Austin and didn't like the weather in Austin uh, in the wintertime. Summers are worse, and uh, <laughs> so we moved back to Jacksonville, which is still hot, but... Not as hot as Austin. So uh, basically, I lived there about 30 years, so it's been uh, like moving back home. And so that's really good. All right. Um, I had the privilege of performing the um, wedding for Fred and Sharon, and uh, it has been uh, such a joy uh, to watch that family grow, and um, uh, even uh, at the point of... Uh, uh, loving the Lord, and uh, the one daughter that's taking an uh, online discipleship course was uh, uh, encouraged to do it from my daughter. So pretty fun. Pretty, pretty fun. Let's talk about how you got started in golf. Fred, let's just start with you and come back. Well, my dad, um, he was about a one, at worst, a one handicap back in the day, and I went caddying for him one day. He or asked me, he says, come on out and carry my bag for me one day when I was 10 years old. And he was playing at the public course, uh, Haynes Point, which is in downtown D.C., and had his big group. I had about 16 guys, and I got done that day, and I said, you know, I'd rather play than carry this bag. And he goes, <laughs> great. And that's how I got started. And then I, we were living within a mile of University of Maryland golf course, and uh, I started working there when I was 11 as cart boy and cleaning the range. And, and so I was always around golf and that's kind of how it took off. Okay, how about for you, Dougie? Well, my dad built a, a house at a, a golf course called Windyke Country Club in Memphis. Uh, it had 36 holes, 18 hole par, three course. We were like the third house in the neighborhood. My dad was a golf fanatic. He uh, loved golf. Uh, he still does, he's sick. 
He's in a nursing home, but he still thinks he plays every now and then. Uh, so we talk a lot of golf, but no, he, he, built, he built the house when I was three, and I mean, I had, that was my backyard my whole childhood. Uh, we had an awesome group of juniors. I was probably the youngest of the group, um, and they called us the Yard Apes out at this course. Uh, the, our, our pro that just got inducted into the Tennessee uh, Golf Hall of Fame, he kind of coined us that name. So we, we still have a Yard Ape uh, text that goes on, and there was about 15 of us, and we just played golf. We either played golf or swam or played tennis or basketball all day, all the summer. I mean, it was like our – just where we lived was at the golf course. So I started – when I was about eight, I never left the golf course. So, anyways – uh, kind of similar story. My, my parents both played. Um, my dad was a single digit handicap and, and, uh, you know, like any six or seven year old, you know, I kind of wanted to do what my dad did. And I didn't understand, um, what being a clinical, uh, a manager of a clinical pathology, uh, company. And so I said, well, he plays golf too. So maybe I'll try that. Um, and I grew up at, I, yeah, I grew up at Royal Oaks Country Club. Um, I got to know Randy Smith was the head pro there uh, when I first started playing. And, and so I spent a lot of time with Randy. And some of you might know he also has, has done a fairly decent job coaching Scotty Scheffler. In fact, Scotty, when I was on the driving range, um, you know, early in my pro career, um, Scotty, his family had just moved from New Jersey to Dallas. And so um, this little kid kept coming over and he'd turn a, a bucket of range balls, you know, over and sit down and watch for 10, 15 minutes wouldn't ask a question, wouldn't say a word, and then he'd go back and hit some more balls and chip and putt. And so I don't know what he absorbed for me. Uh, I wish he would teach it back to me, though. Um, so, uh, and it was the same thing. It was like that's where, you know, summers in Dallas, I mean, we'd, you know, we'd play 18 holes in the morning, eat lunch, go jump in the pool, and then play till dark. And um, happened to get into some of the assistant pros' pockets here and there late in the night. Um, you know, hitting shots at 10 o'clock at night on, you know, a June evening and trying to figure out where the golf ball ended up. Um, I guess I hit it short and straight enough. We could find mine most of the time. So, um, and it just, it developed from there. That's good. Hey, hey, Larry, Justin, I do have to tell one story about, uh, about Randy Smith real quick. So I've taken a dozen lessons from his coach. He's a dear friend of mine and, uh, he would never take money from me, but he goes, I go, well, Randy, what can I do for you? And he goes, well, I love pecan pie. And I go, I've got it. I've got it. My mother-in-law makes the, the best pecan pie in the world. So I would dry, I would put them on, ship them FedEx on dry ice. And Harrison Frazier would walk in his office and literally he'd have the whole thing of ice cream on top of it, oh, yeah. eating yeah. the pecan pies. So I, people know I paid him because, <laughs> because they've got proof with the pecan pies. He's got the greatest coach ever. I just, I just felt like... Uh, a lot of times in pro ams when we're playing it, and a guy hits it close or has a hole in one, and it gets wait, really wait, excited. Wait, 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 hold on. You've I've seen, had a couple of amateur holes make, in one on a, in a pro am. And I've seen two. I've I been out here a long time. I don't know if I've, <laughs> I've been out here with anybody that hits the green. In well, the last that's true. Pro ams. <laughs> good point. That's a good point. But anyway, the conversations comes up, and then and then they say, "How many hole in ones you had?" And I said, "Well, I will give them my answer." And then I said, "But my dad." Had only two hole in ones in his life, but they were in the same round. Wow. wow! So that was pretty cool. And then I witnessed our system, our head pro at University of Maryland. This is a feat that I can't imagine ever been beat. On the number four is a par five, and he holed a three wood for double eagle. The second, uh, the fifth hole is a 230 yard par three, and he holed the same three wood for an ace back to back, back to back three woods for a two and a one. So. So there's hope for everybody. It can happen. I think he gave his life to the Lord that day. I think he did. Well, what's funny is that we made the turn, and he was on destroying the pace of a course record, and he quit. And I go, Ronnie, aren't you going to go to the... No, I'm not going to ruin this round. All right, how long did it take for you to get on tour? Many tours, many, uh, uh, what, what happened? Justin, let's start with you. Because I know Fred's got good stories on this one. Yeah, I, I <clears throat> so I played NCAAs in 1994, um, graduated a month prior to that, 
turned pro, you know, on that Sunday night and went and tried to qualify for the U.S. Open, didn't get through, but I had a, a nice amateur career where I was able to get some sponsors exemptions. Um, my third event was in Kingsmill, Virginia, and um, had a nice week and a good weekend, and I remember there, it was very, very hot. I mean, we were playing there late June, early July. Usually July 4th, yeah. we celebrated at Anheuser-Busch, which is who put on the uh, tournament. Yep. And so you get those little pop-up thunderstorms off the Chesapeake right there. And, and um, I remember walking to the locker room. Now, I, I'm 22 years old. Um, I, I've hardly been in a PG Tour locker room. And everybody, everybody's covered in sweat. And when they walk in the locker room, they all grabbed like a, a bath towel and put it over their shoulders. And I didn't ask anybody what they're doing. I just grabbed one and put it over my shoulders too. I had no idea why they did that. Um, but anyways, I grabbed the bath towel, I put it over my shoulders. I ended up finishing third that week and um, kind of propelled me in through the rest of the year. And I, I got enough sponsors exemptions and I ended up getting my card uh, by one person. Back then it was a soft 125. So I think that year it went to 129. And the last event of the year, I did not get a spot to. It was in Las Vegas. So I had to sit at home while the fate of my, you know, my next year lied in a lot of other people's hands. And fortunately, um, I wasn't necessarily on my walk with Christ at, the, at that time. But uh, had I been, I would have known who to thank. <laughs> Dougie? Well, I played the, uh, I got out of college in, 90, in 92 and played the Hooters tour for a year and then made it always the Nike tour, the Corn Ferry tour, you could call now. I played out there for two years and made it to the tour championship, but not, get, not good enough to get my card and then finished third in the Q school in 96, got on, I was a rookie in 97. How many people have spent their honeymoon in the same apartment as their parents? Um, <laughs> My, my wife and I planned our wedding, uh, and then I happened to finish third in Q school, and my, par my parents went to the Bob Hope with us, so we had a, a year to use our honeymoon in Aruba, but I spent my honeymoon week with my parents in the same apartment, I got to say, so, and my wife stayed with me, I guess, I don't know, uh, so. She is an incredible woman. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't let her come tonight, she came last year, I didn't want to embarrass her too bad, no, anyways, um, yeah, so. That, that's, I can always remember being a rookie because I spent my honeymoon and my first tournament was the Bob Hope Desert Classic. It's so. okay. Her, his parents were hard of hearing, so they were, they were fine. <laughs> <laughs> we still, we still laugh about it. I still can't happened. believe I did it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Dougie, did I leave anything out about your rookie year on the uh, champion store? Anything you want to add to it? Oh, well, there's all kinds of things. What did I do on my rookie? Oh, well, I, you, uh, for the British, you went over there and qualified. Yeah, so I, my reasoning for, you know, I, I saw where I was turning 50 on Wednesday of the British Open. I told my wife, uh, I go, well, I think I'm going to go over there and Monday qualify. It's to be the first week I'll turn 50. I'd been playing a little mini tour events with all the young guys, and I'd won like three out of six of them. So I, was, I had some good confidence, and she goes, she kind of looked at me funny. I go, well, Brandel Chambly doesn't even play golf, and he's qualified for two of them. So I, th I figured I'll go over there. And, <laughs> and so, so I went over there, and I actually was tied for the lead with five holes to go, and I made two bogeys. Uh, it was good to get back in the mix, but uh, I ended up finishing fifth. Uh, got to play with Colin Montgomery in the final round. That was uh, quite a treat. And then, <laughs> and, and, no, I just sure we got to be good friends. I like Colin. Support. He's an awesome dude, you know. Okay. So there we go. I know we could tell Colin stories all day, it's, but I, I, yeah. I know. Cam. But then, then I went to Dick's Sporting Goods in Endicott, New York, and I, I should have bought a house. I was there for 12 days. Uh, you know, I went, I went to the pre-qualifier, like Larry said, and then the qualifier, and then I led the tournament from start to finish. I'd, Larry didn't tell you I played poker in between the, you know, the in between the pre-qualifier and the qualifier. I didn't have anything to do for three days. So. You know what? No wonder you no, were so happy when you won that tournament right. because you were you finally getting out of Endicott, New York. No, I know it was so nice. Uh, yeah. And th that was a memorable week. We won't talk about my other win, the celebration, because he gets embarrassed. So, anyways, but um, 
it, anyways, so. yeah, the uh, <laughs> Ind- Indicott was a cool week, but I ended up making it to the tour championship in eight events uh, my rookie year, and uh, that was that was kind of cool, I thought. And which is top thirty six, top uh, thirty six. So uh, I need to do that right now. I was I'm just coming back from two elbow surgery, so I'm glad to be back here. I love this course. So, but yeah, uh, my I'll, rookie I'll, year was fun. The guys, there are several guys here in the room who were silently rooting for you on eighteen. Uh, and had you made the putt, you would have been in a playoff, I think. And I think at least four guys today told me, we were standing there, and we noticed that he uh, lined up with it breaking, and that putt is straight. We're all members of that course. We know it's straight. Could we have said it was okay? No, it's straight. I said, no, you can't say that. I wish you would have because my uh, Shane Birch was filmed that putt from behind, and you know, if y'all remember last year, it was cold and windy and misty, and you could barely see. I can't see in that lighting. I'm really hard when it gets like that. And so I, me and my caddy both saw it going left, and it went right. It was embarrassing. But uh, I actually <laughs> actually hit a good putt. I, I, but well, you I, hit it where you aimed it. I had to kick the pin after that read, though. So, anyways, it was it was fun to have a chance to win. Still uh, have the same caddy? No, I got my best friend caddy. And, okay, you got, yeah, but that I, caddy I, lost I, his I job. Had, on I that had one. Tommy Anderson. You know, so, you know, we Fred, had, how about you getting on the tour? Well, I use the analogy of, like how long it took for Jesus to show up in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> it took a long time. <laughs> I, oh, Lordy. I was I was almost senior tour by the time I got out. It was I was thirty two. <laughs> And and I was really tired, <laughs> but but I made it and I kept plugging from there. But I was a 32 year old rookie and and um, I really had one goal. I wanted to keep my card one time. I wanted to qualify, and then I wanted to keep my card one time. I lost my card to rookie year, got it right back, and then I was able to keep it ever since. And it took me a while before I really felt comfortable on the tour where I felt like I belonged. Um, I won my first tournament in 92 in Houston, but, and that was the year I met Sharon, my current wife, and um, uh, I still, it was like, he didn't want to be the one and done guy. I didn't want to be one of those guys. Oh, he won one tournament and he never did, showed up again. So the pressure of winning the second one was a lot harder than winning the first one because the first one came out of nowhere. And, um, and it turned out to be, you know, a really good career, but it, it took me a long time to get there, and then it took me a long time to feel comfortable. I wasn't like these studs coming out of college like Justin and and all these guys that get get out right out of, out of college, and then they just have this great career, and, and it's it's awesome. So it took me a while, and and um, it, it's been a good ride. Let me just put it that way. So it was, it was fun, and I still love competing and, and playing with the guys. But really, what's so great about the, the – probably the only reason I'm – if Jay Haas is not in the field, I'm the oldest guy playing. He's playing this week, and I'm playing with him. <laughs> and Cal Kavecki. So they got the, all the oldest and the most injured three guys in one group. Wait, Do they but, have walkers? <laughs> That's yeah, got to be like right. 200 yeah, years of life in that group, years. something like that. You know, it would be great if we had walkers. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Just lean up, going up the hill. So Fred, Although it is Kukui, I don't know whether they would roll very good because the ball doesn't roll very good. You didn't tell them what you did before you got on tour. You hit range balls. They paid you to hit range balls for a living, and you got to call yourself a golf coach. Isn't that right? That's kind of mean. I know. No, it's That's not. Kinda mean. <laughs> it's a truth. But, yeah, I, I try to lead by example. I hit more golf balls than any of the kids I recruited. I was a golf coach at University of Maryland uh, at 24 through – until I got on tour, and uh, I just tried to outwork everybody. I was trying to, I I just had a really strong work ethic, and I figured the guys might follow me. None of them did. They went drinking. I went to hit balls, and and, uh, it's just the way it was, but it paid off for me. None of them made it, (laughs) and I did. (laughs) What, What you failed to tell them, Fred, is he came right out of college to the tour, and so did you. You just stayed at Maryland. (laughs) When you gave up being a coach, you went out on tour. I didn't think of that perspective. That's true. I think that's one of the greatest stories ever, though. I mean, it's just awesome what you did, though. 
All right, I got a question. Scotty Scheffler came from what? How far back on Sunday? Five. Yeah. Five. Yeah, you all were watching. There was another player on the platform here who came back from five on Sunday and won the Players' Championship, staying right here to my right. What was that like starting Sunday morning? Well, I... I'd had a little experience being five back, um, <laughs> but but actually going was, the right way. That it, was five back of fortieth, not at, first. Well, true. <laughs> <clears throat> um, at, at the Open Championship the summer before that, I was five back playing in the next to last group, um, and went out and played aggressively, and and because I had nothing to lose really, and. And uh, it worked out in my favor. So I figure, well, I'm just going to employ this same strategy. And, and um, you know, I need to get off to a good start. And I think I eagled the second hole and made a couple other birdies and birdied eight. And, you know, all of a sudden I was kind of, I was, let's see, I think Lee Jansen and Glenn Day were in the last group. And, um, you know, it's different being five back. You only have to catch two people. I think Scotty was quite a few groups, you know, yeah. uh, behind him so he had to pass quite a few players but uh and next then wait and then wait yeah I never had to go hit balls um afterwards so yeah just playing aggressively and and um you know I I made a nice up and down for birdie at, at 11 um I made a couple long putts at 13 and 14 and and um if you remember the name Len Matisse uh he was from Jacksonville and he, I don't know if he was, if we were tied for the lead when he was standing on 17, or if he was one ahead, I'm not sure. I think we may have been tied. And I was walking up to 16 green, and I'd, I'd hear a shot, and I'd hear kind of a beginning of a cheer, and then a groan. And I heard that like three times, because he made a seven, I think, on the 17th hole. Um, and uh, so then from there, from there, I just knew I had to keep it dry, and... and Probably the biggest sense of relief I've ever felt was when that ball is, is about to land on the green on 17, and you see it bounce, and then it doesn't disappear. You see it stay on the green. Um, that's the biggest sense of relief I've, I've ever felt. Oh, that's amazing. You won it in 2005. Any particular memories from that, Fred? Yeah, quite a lot, actually. Um, We'll have the tomorrow night meeting, and I can finish my story. Cause I, <laughs> but <laughs> no, only kidding. Uh, what was rare, a lot of guys don't remember, a lot of people don't remember that we had to finish on a Monday, and we only got, I only got 40 holes of golf in in four days. We had so much rain. It just rained and rained and rained, and we're on and off and on and off <laughs> the golf course. I almost missed a restart because we thought we were done for the day. I was living about a, two miles away. Had I not been, I would have been DQ'd, but I went home, go to bed, or take a nap. I was taking a nap. My caddy calls, we're in position on the 10th hole. I had to play. That's where I was going to start. He says, we're in position in 20 minutes. I go, geez, I'll flip. I threw on my clothes and got to the tee just in time and finished, and then we're off. The, we play two holes, another rainstorm. We're off again. So anyway, we wake up Monday, and we got to finish the third round and fourth round on Monday. And I was starting to hitting my second shot into five of my third round. And I shot 65, 72, and then I shot, uh, managed to shoot 71 that day, and the average score was about 76, 77, with 30, 35 mile an hour winds that day. And we had a 42 mile an hour gust, and it was just howling. Ended up playing right into my hands because uh, the bombers would, the rough was like this because they hadn't been able to mow it all week. And all the guys hitting the real high shots, the winds were blowing it, you know, into the rough. They didn't have control of the golf ball. And I'm hitting my little pea shooter down there low. And um, I literally never hit it in the rough all week. I had one shot that was in the first cut. And I was controlling my ball. And I remember I was on the second shot of, this, of my second hole that day on number six. And I was trying to knock down this little, little shot. And I think I had an eight iron. And I hit it perfect. I knocked it down and I controlled the trajectory just right. And I told my caddy, I says, I got it. He goes, you got what? I said, I got control of my ball. He says, Ooh, that's good. Well, I, I worked my way around, shot 71, 
we restarted, did not repair, so leaders are all over the golf course. There's no last group, there's no nothing, it's just guys are all over the place. You got hot, got cold, you fell on and off. And um, I was on the seventh hole, saw I was about two or three shots back. I said, I'll make a few birdies, I can get going. And my caddy goes, well, you better start. I mean, it'd be a nice time to start. And I remember I made a 30-footer on seven, I made a 30, 40-footer on eight, I, I did not birdie nine, I birdied 10, made a great par on 11, birdie 12 and 13. Now I do not want to see the leaderboard because I know I'm doing something good. And I mistakenly saw it on 14 and I had a three-shot lead and I went, crap. <laughs> I said something different, but it basically resembled crap. <laughs> and, and uh, my caddy goes, what's wrong? He says, I just saw the leaderboard. He said, you weren't supposed to see the leaderboard. I said, I didn't mean to see the leaderboard. I got a three-shot lead. He goes, well, what's the problem with that? I said, it's my tournament to lose. Well, I went on to go three-putt, three-putt. And then I had hard putts. They were really hard putts. <laughs> but, but I go three-putt, three-putt. And I hit a three-iron into, uh, this is how long I used to be. I hit a three-iron into 16, although it was down 30-mile-an-hour wind to about 20 feet for eagle, two putt. Well, I get to 17, and there's a group on the, on the green, three groups on the tee, including oh. ours. Oh. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And, and I'm seeing the group, two groups ahead, two of the three hit in the water, the group ahead, two of the three hit in the water. Because I just went bogey, bogey, birdie, and, and Adam Scott and Vaughn Taylor made birdies. I didn't have honors. I was last up. They both hit it in the water. And I'm like, how do you, how do you hit the green? Well, I hit the green. I hit a six iron. It's usually a eight iron. It was blowing in out of the left, and uh, and then I three putted. <laughs> so I walked to 18, and I know Tom Lehman's already in the house, and I got to make par, and I hit the best drive of my life on over the boards on 18, and I hit a six iron in the bunker, and I got up and down, and now I had to dodge Scott Verplank and Luke Donald. If they make birdie, they tie. Uh, Scotty blew it right in the rough, so he's done on off the tee, and Luke hit it over the green, just, just over the green. And where I slammed my hat, I made an indentation in the green that I didn't fix. And to this day, I'm not telling Luke, don't you tell Luke, but his chip hit that dent, and it deflected it from going in the hole. Winner. To the story tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's the short version, by the way. Yes. <laughs> most memorable. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help it. I just can't. I can't but mem it. Most memorable shot, Justin? That I've hit. Yeah. Or somebody else. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> um, my most, well, okay. My most memorable shot that you would probably expect me to say would be the putt at the Ryder Cup. 99. <laughs> they thought they had it in the bag yeah. till you hit that putt. But the most memorable shot that I personally, I think the best shot that I ever hit was the three iron I hit on 17 at Royal Troon. That was my favorite shot. But my most memorable shot is certainly the putt at Brookline. Yeah, that was a good one. Dougie, your most memorable shot. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, I was two down with three to go to Steve Flesh, and I birdied two holes in a row and went from two down to one up on the last hole up in Calgary. And uh, the second shot's over water, and it's kind of a tight shot. And if I hit the green, it was over. I hit the best four iron of my life, about 30 feet, and it was all over. So it made it was. Hard to forget that one. Uh, it was good. That was a great one. Yeah. Freddie? Mine's a little different. <laughs> it, it might surprise you, but the We're better than getting most, to know that. So everybody knows the Gary Coke better than most putt when Tiger made the putt on 17 at player. <coughs> it was on a Saturday, whatever year that was, I don't remember, but I was playing in front of him. He's on the tee. He's watching me five putt. My only five putt. But the most memorable shot I ever had, I had a three and a half, four footer for my fifth putt, and I made it. <laughs> because I couldn't imagine six putting. <laughs> uh, so there you go. That, that's it. All right. I'm very positive about my negativity, by the way. 
I wish I had time to tell you this shot and let him set it up, but we don't. But he is the straightest hitter of the golf ball I've ever seen. And if you ever go to a place called Pablo Creek, it's built right on the intercoastal, uh, uh, just off of Jack's Beach. And he didn't miss the center of the fairway in 18 holes, more than a foot or a foot and a half, and that's not a lie. He hits it on 18, we're on the back tee, and they have three tees that they built in the marshes up that are like four feet wide and maybe nine feet uh, deep, uh, three of them, and we're on the last one, and we get up there, and he's sitting right near a sprinkler head, which is dead center uh, in the fairway, and I say to Fred, I bet if you teed it up, you could hit it back to that four feet wide, nine foot deep tee back there. Now I'll let you finish the story so that we do some other things. I did tee it up in the fairway, and I hit it. It was about as, literally, it was smaller than this stage was the was. back tee. And I hit it, and it goes right there, and I saw it bounce on the tee, but you couldn't see where it ended up. And I said, Larry, I, we got to go back and see where that is. <laughs> and, it, and it's laying on the back of the tee, and it was truly probably the best drive I've ever hit in my life that meant absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. It was really I don't want to bring that up. No, 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 no. No, now I can still hit fairways if I can reach them. And that's, <laughs> and, and, and that's an issue with me right now, unfortunately. We got the, the second hole at Madison. It's not that far, but it's like a 230-yard carry over this creek. And if it's, it's downhill, Fred. It's downhill. <laughs> I was getting to that. It's downhill. Well, you've seen Mostly me. It's downhill. into the wind it's and downhill. uphill. No, it's not. It's downhill, Fred. It's downhill. And if the wind is just going, whew, I'm laying up. And it's embarrassing. But I can't reach the green anyway, so what the hell? I might as well lay up as I lay up short of the creek. And I just said, guys, I, I apologize to my playing partners. I said, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> You got to witness this, but I'm laying up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, short one. Favorite course? Favorite course? Uh, Pebble Beach. All right. Pebble, Pebble Beach. Beach. Pebble Beach. Uh, my favorite course is Pine Valley. Ah, okay. Yeah. I got my best, fa my favorite in probably in the world is Turnberry. Oh. I go with Turnberry over in Scotland. Oh. It's, it's so good. And that's where you won, right? Oh, you want a true? Yeah. 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 yeah, great, great course. All great courses. All right, let's, let's shift a little bit. Uh, all three of you uh, not only love golf, but you also love God. Uh, let's talk about your own spiritual journey. Fred, we'll start with you coming back this way. Boy. Um, I was, I always believed in God as when I was a kid, my, my, uh, it was my stepdad, but he was the only dad I ever knew. Um, and he was a devout Catholic growing up. And we, I just didn't have, we didn't have time the way for Sunday services. So I really very seldom went to Sunday services because I was working at a golf course when I was 11 years old and um, had a paper route and all that when I was eight years old. So I never really had time for the church and my, my, uh, Parents really didn't make me go, so I didn't go. But I always believed in God, but I didn't really know what that belief meant. I have, had really no idea what it meant. And other than that there was a, a more powerful being and there's some sort of creation that created all this, or creator. But um, it really, uh, I got to fast forward all the way to when I got on the tour and in, you had the fellowship of Christian athletes, and we had guys on our tour that were uh, born again. And those born again guys were uh, the guys that I really looked up to when I was early in my career on the tour was Larry Mize and Scott Simpson, Tom Lehman, Bernhard Langer. Um, there's a couple others that were those first guys, but those four were really, really strong 
guys that they didn't know that I was looking at them and how they handled themselves, or I noticed how they handled themselves in everyday life, good or bad. They didn't seem to be identified with what they shot on the golf course. They obviously would be upset if they didn't play well or disappointed, whatever. We all felt that, but that's human nature. But they didn't feel like that's who they were. And to me, everything I was was what I was on a golf course. If I played good, I was, ah, I'm, I'm a great guy. And if I didn't play good, I'm, I'm miserable. I was just like everything revolved around what I shot. And, and it's still difficult to, to uh, fight that, that emotion. But I saw these guys handle themselves good and bad. And they, off the golf course, they were just remarkable human beings that I really enjoyed being around. And I actually went up to him. Uh, I remember going up to Tom Lehman. We were over at the British Open one year, and I said, Tom, I don't want to go through life. I don't know how long I'm going to be out here. Um, I really admire you. I really respect you. I don't want to go through life and, and, we get, and not tell you what impact you've had on me. And, um, and I said that to Larry, and I said that to Scott. I don't know if I ever told Bernhard that. I got to tell Bernhard that one. I, <laughs> but I think the world of uh, Bernhard, Bernhard has and, time and now. I've told if you wanted that. to, but uh, but anyway, I have told him that, and really that started my journey, I would say. And then meeting Larry uh, has been a huge impact on a lot of us on the tour. He's an amazing speaker, amazing storyteller, amazing human being, and his family's amazing. His wife Ruthie. Um, has had a huge impact on a lot of us on the tour, but the life on the road is really difficult. Uh, it's not glamorous at all. The the chase, the loneliness of being a tour pro is, um, people don't realize it's not glamorous. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of time by yourself. There's a lot of reflection. There's a lot of downtime, and there's a lot of down moments. Um, so you, you just feel like you got to have somebody to help you out, and it, and I found that through a belief in Jesus Christ really helps. He's kind of like, uh, I like that, whatever that song is, Jesus Take the Wheel. Um, boy, that's a that's a saying I've said on the golf course a lot of times, that Jesus, you know, I, I don't got it. I says, this is, just give me, you take the wheel, I'll try to make the swing, and whatever happens, happens. Um, I remember when I did win the players, Larry gave me the Philippians verse, and don't worry about anything, pray about everything. Well, when you're playing the Pete Dye golf course, <laughs> you're praying a lot, and, and, and you're worried a lot, because you're looking out there, and you see a lot of stuff you don't want to go into, and I, and I had this verse, and I literally read it every shot, before I hit every shot, and I had it in my yardage book, and... Uh, it really helps. So it's just knowing that you have um, somebody that's always got your back. And um, and if you believe in, you know, to me, it it's really comes down to simple. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross and came back, it's a slam dunk. You got it right there. He's the only guy that's defeated death. And, uh, and it's pretty easy. I mean, it's... it's Pretty, there's so much evidence that all of this is true, and and the story of the Bible is. I I did read the Bible. I had a uh, from front page to to the back. I, I had a staph infection in my knee in 08, and uh, and I was had a bunch of time I had where I was trying to rehab. I almost lost my leg, but um, I decided I went in. I actually went in on crutches into um, a bookstore. And it said, read the Bible in 90 days. And I went, I could do that. I got three months. The doctor said, you need three months. And I said, this is perfect. So I read that Bible for 90 days, however many chapters that was in, in uh, each day. And I did kind of blow through the genealogy part. I didn't want to. He begot. He begot uh, I wouldn't remember that anyway. Yeah. But, but anyway, I got done. And it just, everything that that's kind of happens is not a coincidence, I believe. 
coincidences are not coincidences all the time. Me knowing, me getting on tour, me getting to meet guys like Langer and, and the guys I mentioned, Lehman, um, and Larry Mize, Scott Simpson, were powerful guys in my life uh, in that part of my career. And uh, I still just owe them and owe Larry uh, where I am in my journey. I'm still, everybody's in a different part of the walk and walk with uh, Jesus, but uh, it's really helped me a lot in my really down times, the tough times, the the times when you doubt yourself, you just feel like you can have somebody that's got your back, and it's not that big a deal, and, and actually, we were talking about the table, when you first get out on tour, and in your journey through the tour, you're only as good as what you shoot, and you identify yourself as that. But now you look back and I just go, God, I wish I just had a different perspective of that. It's really not that big a deal. Nobody really cares whether I won whatever. And I don't really, to me, it's like, oh, yeah, I had a great tournament. It's funny. You, you, I, I remember the week when I won the players. It's like it didn't matter the next week. It's gear up again. Let's go. We've got to go again. It's not how I want to be identified because of what you won. Nobody really cares. I don't identify Justin Leonard because he won the British. I identify Justin as this unbelievably great guy that's become a really good friend. It doesn't matter what he did on the golf course. Same with Doug. Same with all the guys on the tour. Now it's like we want to be identified as what we do in life, and it's more what we are not in the business world, in the corporate world, the professional world, it's how we are as individuals. Family, how we treat our family, how we raise our family, how we treat other people, and I just wish we could get our world to treat the way everybody wants to be treated, and then we'd be really good. Yeah. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> Dougie? Well, that was very good, Freddie. Uh, um, I grew up. I grew up going to church. My my parents took me to church every Sunday. I grew up in the Methodist church. I went through confirmation. I just never got it. I just got to be honest. I never got it. Um, went to church all through high school, but uh, never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ until oh Stan Utley. Y'all have heard of him. He's a great short game teacher. Uh, I was playing out on the Nike tour. I was 24 years old. He invited me to go to a Bible study that the FCA did on the, uh, called the Corn Ferry Tour, Nike Tour, whatever. And I, and I went for a year. I went, I went to the Bible studies for a year and questioned it and questioned it. And when I was 26 years old, I decided to give my life to Christ. And honestly, I uh, got on tour the next year and, and, uh, Obviously met Larry and have been friends with him since I was 27 years old. Uh, but I, even then, I didn't always get it. And I always tell people, uh, the, I, I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version. I'm not the, I can't tell stories like Fred. Uh, but I didn't really surrender to Christ. I was probably 41 years old. I, I look back and that's when I really kind of just lived for him. But I, but I, I love what Fred said about not being identified as a golfer. When I was on the PGA Tour, I never felt like I belonged. Uh, um, I didn't have the two careers as these guys. I, I've been blessed uh, since I've been out here. But, you know, I've, been, I've only played two tournaments since I finished second here last year. And there's a lot of positives to that because my identity as a golfer was taken away once again. And I got to be home and be a dad and be a husband and uh, – be with my friends. I didn't have to hang out with the friends that only hung out with me because I played golf. That was nice to get rid of all of them again. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, but no, you know, we, we started actually going to a new church. Uh, I one of the guys that discipled me for two years was killed in a plane crash last year, and um, dear friend, uh, friends with his whole family. Uh, his dad was the guy I was just talking about that got inducted to the Tennessee Golf Hall of Fame, but. Um, the pastor at that church was one of five guys that survived the plane crash. And I've, I i don't know what drew me to changing churches. I think it was during COVID. We just weren't going consistently. And when I was out of town playing, my, my family wasn't going. So I was like, honey, let's try a new church. We know everybody here. And, you know, it's 
y'all, we, we always hear good things. I'd probably give him Kenan, who's the pastor at this church. He survived the plane crash. He was in the hospital for three months, probably giving him two dozen golf lessons. I've been helping his son since I've been out of the game. He's got four sons, five sons, excuse me. Uh, but, yeah, my, my journey with Christ has, has been a roller coaster. I'm sitting here looking at that carpet. It's been like this, and... Jesus is, I, I totally look back at my life, and Jesus had his eye on me the entire time. I mean, I don't know how I lived through college. I was, I used to make fun of guys having the Bible study on the way out when I had two, a 12-pack of beer in each hand. And I mean, I, I just look back at so many things where God just was there protecting me or looking over me. So, I mean, I always tell Larry, I'm, I've got to go speak every time you ask because he's been with me through so many crazy times and great times. Uh, he's given me a great wife, a great family. Uh, he's put incredible people in my life to teach me, uh, great mentors. And I mean, I'm very blessed. I feel like a very blessed man. I, and, and like I say, I've, I've had my golf identity taken away from me again. And I'm starting all over and I'm, I'm playing with an elbow that I don't know if it'll last another week or three more years or five more years. So it really is nice to not put your identity in, in your job all the time, and uh, stepping back and accepting that, it's it's really kind of taking the pressure off of me, even coming back out here. I know the only way I stay out here is to finish in the top 36 or win, so I don't really have any pressure because I can just kind of wing it every week, you know, uh, <laughs> and that's what I've done since I've been out here, so yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that that's, I guess, my encouragement to you is, is that I've had really a great year being home. I play a lot of bridge now. If y'all are bridge players, I, I, I got 90-year-old women killing me at bridge. Uh, <laughs> I'm not joking. So it's kept my brain sharp, but, man, it's humble. You talk about humble. These guys, I don't mind getting beat by these guys, but these, these, these old ladies are killing me at bridge. So anyways, uh, so I, I, I think it's, I think Jesus has given me an avenue that I know that I'll, I'll survive whether I play golf or not, and I'm, I'm glad my identity's not in golf. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously envious of these two's career, but they're, they're, they're better friends in Christ than they are golfers, so uh, it's really that's cool. That's great. So, thanks, thanks, Dougie. <laughs> Justin? I, I grew up going to church <clears throat> um, some of the time. Depending, you know, if the weather was good or we had an early tea time on Sunday, uh, we would go on Mother's Day. We would go on Christmas and Easter, and and um, you know, I knew, I knew, I had a sense of who Jesus was. I had a sense of of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> you know, I went to the high school youth group for a while, leading up to the high school youth group ski trip. Yes. And uh, they sang a bunch of songs that I'd never heard of. Um, and I just kind of mouthed some words. And, and uh, yeah, so I went on the church ski trip. Um, wasn't really there for the right purposes, to be honest. Um, but I got to ski for a week, so that was fun. Um, then, um, you know, playing the tour, playing with these guys. You know, yeah, I heard there was a Bible study. I was kind of really wrapped up into myself at that time. And. And then I met a certain lady who happens to be in the room, um, and she was very involved in a Bible study in Dallas, and um, all of a sudden, like, just being around her, I wanted to go to church, and I wanted to understand, I wanted to have a piece of what she had, and the piece was peace, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Um, so we got married in 2002, and... Um, uh, I wasn't in a Bible study or anything, but I was, I was very, very curious. And uh, so got married in, in February of 2002, and we show up at Hilton Head, which is, you know, beginning mid-April uh, of that year. And um, I saw Larry, and, and of course, I'd known him for, for, you know, a few years now. And, and uh, Amanda had seen something in the in the the dining room or something about the Bible study that week. And she goes, why don't we go to the PG Tour Bible study? I go, you know what? That'd be great. I'd love to do that. So we go on, it was Tuesday night, I believe. And um, have you ever been in a room 
with a lot of people like this. And the certain speaker happens to, you felt like was just speaking to you. Mm. That's what I experienced. <clears throat> and uh, after the Bible study, <laughs> you may have to finish this. Um, <laughs> You'll do just I fine. asked Larry, I said, look, I'm ready. I want to give my life to Christ. And uh, we said the sinner's prayer together. Um, and the journey, <clears throat> you know, like Doug said, it ebbs and flows. And um, it doesn't mean you're guaranteed a smooth ride. It does guarantee you know where you're going to end up. Um, and it's just finding that personal relationship with something that I never really understood growing up. I never understood that on the ski trip. I never on listening to songs that I'd never heard of. Um, understanding like that that my relationship with him is more important than anything that I can do on this earth um, to somebody that <clears throat> may not always answer me in my time, but I understand that his time, he knows way more than I do, and his time is better than my time. Um, but just having, and then I think it's so important, and we're so lucky, the three of us up here on stage, to have mentor in, in people like, like Larry and his wife Ruthie, um, who are ahead of us in our walk to help guide us through things. I also think it's so important to have people on the other side that you can mentor and bring in because that, that constant, you know, whether it's a business relationship or a faith relationship, um, that constant, you know, seeking knowledge that the wise one has and being able to articulate it and pass it down to somebody else, uh, there's no better way to make something your own, whether it's your, your, your personal life, your business life, or your faith life. Um, having men or women around you that are at different stages of the walk, uh, I think that's, that's where the true inspiration, the true wisdom, being able to understand something and then try and turn around and teach it, um, you know, there's nothing that you do that in your faith, your life will be your own. Um, you will own it. And, um, I'm just so, I'm so blessed to be, uh, surrounded by authentic people who will give it to me straight, um, good and bad. And, um, of course I'm blessed for, you know, my, my 22 years over there and then now, and now being able to like you know instill some of these ideas into our children and now they're old enough like they're coming to it themselves and um you know it's it's just it's very rewarding to see them walk the way they do and um the way they can turn and and be an example to you know their friends or classmates or teammates whatever it may be so um, you know, the, the whole, you know, being a steward is, is teaching and passing things down. And, um, Larry, you may be the best steward of anybody I've ever met. Hmm. Oh, they're much greater than me, buddy. <laughs> I can remember a young man who came out on the tour the same time I did. He loved wearing knickers. And for 17 years, um, he asked me questions about God and where he was coming from and how did all of that fit. And um, two years before God took him home, uh, he gave his life to Christ, Payne Stewart. And it was his son, Aaron, who had been at Camp Kanakuk and had gotten the what would Jesus do bracelet, WWJD. And um, he, 
Payne always thought that the guys that came to the Bible study were hypocrites. And I said, well, there's room for one more, buddy. <laughs> and, and he would laugh, but after he trusted Christ, he was feeling like, wow, I had said such things about those guys before. He said, I, I didn't know, but then he started coming, and his son challenged him to put on that bracelet. And the U.S. Open this year is at Pinehurst, and there's a life-size bronze statue at uh, Pinehurst that has this fist going out, and it has the WWJD bracelet on it. It's such a beautiful thing. And I remember going to the funeral, and there were two men that I knew had not yet quite given their hearts to Jesus. And Ruthie and I on that day began to pray specifically for Davis and for you, who were teammates of him on that Ryder Cup team. And um, I'll never forget what a great night it was for me in, uh, at Hilton Head uh, when you came to that place and what a great answer to prayer. And uh, I want to tell you, that's what Jesus Christ offers to you and me. Uh, it doesn't mean there aren't problems. doesn't mean that it'll always turn out right. But God says he loves us so much, cares for us, even while we were yet sinners, the Bible says. Jesus came and paid the penalty for Larry Moody's stuff, for Justin's stuff, for Dougie's stuff, for Fred's stuff, and by the way, for your stuff. The penalty had to be paid because God is not only a loving God, he's a holy and just God. But the only way for Larry Moody's sins to be paid for is for him to do it. I'll never forget Alan Sandage, who lived not too far from here. He was the head of Mount Wilson and Mount Palomar uh, observatories. Dr. Sandage was Hubble's assistant when the Big Bang happened. For 35 years, he was the world's leading astronomer, and he was an atheist. I was at his coming out party in 1982. His coming out party was that he was no longer an atheist, but a follower of Jesus. He said he had no religious upbringing, and so he took the five major religions and studied them. He said, Larry, four of them told me what I had to do for God. One of them told me what God did for me. He said, and that's the one that had the thumbprint of the designer I had studied for 35 years but didn't know his name. Jesus Christ made available to all of us an eternal relationship with a living God. I, um, I was going to read the uh, sinner's prayer to you that my dear friend prayed that night, but I think it would be better if he led you in it. Um, so why don't we take a moment to bow your head. If the Lord's been working in your heart and you would like to establish that relationship with the Lord, I'd encourage you to pray in your own heart um, as this man who prayed it himself so many years ago. Uh, as he uh, reads you that prayer. Dear God, I admit that I am a sinner, and I understand that my sin separates me from you. I believe that Jesus, being God, paid the penalty for all my sins when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. I want to place my trust in him as my Savior, Thank you for loving and forgiving me and giving to me the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you may have prayed that prayer tonight and began an eternal relationship with the living God, but you may say, yeah, that's great for these guys, but I still have a lot of questions. The beauty of this night is this night, the graciousness of these dear folks is being sponsored in part 
by the Lynx players, which gets together with guys and, I don't know, some gals, but Lynx groups I know meet. Uh, and you can ask those questions. If you still have questions and you're not ready to pray that prayer, get with the Lynx group. Let those questions be answered. And I'm going to ask Derek to come back up and, oh, he's got a thing in his hands. Look at you. He's got signed flags by these guys. Hey, let's give these guys a round of applause, huh? <laughs> and Larry's right. Some of you have been invited tonight from friends that love you, and God loves you. And so, again, these Lynx Fellowships are meeting throughout the uh, I handle Southern California. We have over 45 fellowships, both men and women. And these men and women would love to invite you to come to their fellowships. So one of the things I want you to do on your table, we're going to high tech now. Instead of filling out a card, uh, you go to the QR code there. And I want you to put in what you thought about tonight. And one of the things we're going to do, thanks to Fred and, and Doug and Justin, they signed a couple of these flags. So we're going to, we're going to kind of do a raffle and drawing. But you don't qualify unless you fill out that. So that's kind of your homework for tonight. But one of the things, again, if you got questions, remember, there are men and women around here tonight that would love to answer those questions. And, and again, if you guys um, want more questions, go to our website, linksplayers.com. We've got a lot of interviews. Uh, Justin was on our magazine. You were in our magazine. And Fred, you were in our magazine. I couldn't find it. It was kind of a while ago. But, <laughs> but hey, let's give these guys a warm applause. And again, thank you for coming tonight. Look forward to next year. And these guys will be down here. If you guys want to get an autograph, I gave them an actual uh, Sharpie if you guys want to do that. And, uh, but get these guys out of here early because they got to tee up. Now, here's the key thing. Now, you know, next year, uh, last year, Doug was there. He was ready to take it home. But wasn't it helpful? You had fans out there that encouraged you. And that's really what we want to do. Let's encourage these guys out there. And, they, and you've heard their stories, you know. You may not have the whistle that... Uh, our friend Larry has, but you can go and root him on and say you're praying for him, for, for them. And but most importantly, you know that you got friends out here that love you guys. So thank you for being here tonight. All right. God bless you guys. Drive safely. Again, good night.